talk it out. We're nearly to the end here. I promise you there's a reward in the form of libations coming soon. Um, you know, the, in the theme of collaboration, uh, you've heard a lot about collaborating with and without internal teams and with and without adversaries or competitors. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit more about that with, with a team of industry professionals, very accomplished people, I'll introduce in a second, just to get, their, uh, inform, get them to collaborate on their individual perspectives on the topic. So, um, looks like we're ready. We, we, we talked quite a bit today also about this sense that, that certainly, certainly I have, and I know it's been a topic within our team, that there's a bit of a shift going on in the industry. And we, we talk about it all the time in, in terms of how that's going to affect our own strategies. But uh, I'm really curious to get the perspective uh, of a few others in the industry to see whether they do or they don't agree, what they may or may not be doing about it. So I'm going to bring them up uh, as we go. Um, a couple of them I've known for a very long time, and one I've only had the chance to meet very recently. But I'd like to start with Mr. Brett Smith from Counterculture Coffee. Come on up, Brett. Thanks, Brett. Joe. Should I sit? <laughs> also, uh, again, as I mentioned, someone I just had the pleasure of meeting last night. Um, Tricia Zimmer Ferguson from Caldi's Coffee in St. Louis. Okay. Uh, last but not least, uh, someone I've had the pleasure of uh, a lot of fun daytime talks and a few crazy evenings. Uh, Mr. Doug Zell from the Coffee Intel or Intelligentsia Company. Thank you. That is amazing. So I've been preloaded with a few questions here I may or may not decide to use. So as I said, uh, there, we at La Marzocco have had this sense that, that the industry is going through a shift or a, a change. It, it, certainly it's always been evolving, but um, they're just us have the feel of, of a different time. Uh, I mean, Brett, would you agree with that at all? And if so, what do you think you're doing about it? <laughs> Good question. Um, I think there's been some consolidation in the industry a little bit lately. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting time. Um, and to the, the keynote speaker was talking about, you know, focus and focusing on yourself, your person, you know, what you want to do personally, what your company wants to do, then listening to the consumer after that. And he talked about the noise that can happen in an industry. And, um, and of course, with all the acquisitions lately, uh, it, it's been a heady time for me. I mean, today alone, I got three more emails from private equity firms, and that's oh god. And uh, <laughs> and um, but, and all that certainly gets your attention. Um, but we started contemplating what that means to the industry a few years ago when TSG acquired Stumptown, and I would talk to the private equity just to sort of get a feel for what's going on out there. And I think that ultimately, um, the first reaction to it, my reaction was, what kind of danger does this present to us as a company? Are we at risk of not being able to continue what we're doing? Do we need to change? Do we need to modify? Do we need to get out of the business altogether? So you just sort of start maybe, I don't know why, but I started from the paranoid perspective to see you know, really what that means for us. Um, and then from there, it's, okay, is this an opportunity? Uh, either a financial opportunity or what, what kind of opportunity is it? And, and, and for me, from the financial opportunity perspective, I, I ask, can we go forward, accomplish our goals uh, with our current model without trying to raise money or do I want to cash out or whatever? And I think that's a personal decision. After I got past the business decision of does it make sense for the business, um, you know, what does it mean for me as an individual and as an owner? Um, I guess at the end of the day, the conclusion that I came to is, and, and I've talked to a lot of people at this show and a lot of people the last six months and year and thought about it. And the industry we're in still, I think that there's a reality of the size of the industry. Now we're tiny, but over the last few years as I've worked with people through World Coffee Research, 
um, although I knew it was a big industry, but to sit around a table where literally in one year the people around me sell two billion pounds of coffee. And there's a realization that those pounds want to get better. That's sort of the term I use. And so I think about where we're positioned and where specialty is, is positioned, and I think we're in an incredible position. And I think to a degree, although it's, it's not noise for everybody, for us I felt like the acquisition activity and all that's going on there, it's a little bit of noise. So what we decided to do is sit back and, and ask ourselves, does our model still work? Are we still passionate about it? Do we think that we can continue doing what we want to do, accomplish our goals under those circumstances? Is the market still going to be there? And our conclusion is it is. And we're not with total blinders on, but we're staying focused. We're continuing to do what we feel works for us. We continue to feel it's going to be relevant in the market. And we continue to feel that while the the acquisition activity is great in many respects. For us, it, it's not necessary and it's not what we want to do and it, and it doesn't present a, a real danger to us. It's certainly, to me, and my last thought is to, to me, it shows that the outside world appreciates just how great this industry is and there are great opportunities um, to, to grow in specialty. Well, thanks, Brett. Clearly it's working for you. Tricia, I'm, I'm not sure everyone's familiar with your strategies, and myself sure. I've been included, but it seems like your company's actually been making some acquisitions and, and even taking on some other brands. Is, is this part of your, your strategy for going forward and dealing with the changes? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I haven't been in the industry quite, quite as long as these gentlemen um, besides me, but I think, um, I don't think it's a surprise what's happening. I mean, I think you know, um, as I've learned and spent more time really understanding where we sit within specialty coffee, I think that um, if you kind of study the business trends and know where things are going, that this was kind of the next step for us. And um, so, yeah, for us, people say, you know, are you getting calls? And, you know, what, what does that mean for you guys? I mean, I'm young. So for me, it's about the long-term horizon, and we have a long-term strategy. So uh, we're not in the business of, of um, selling right now, but you know, to me, it's about what acquisitions are out there. And so for our for our business, well, you know, we we've never really started it from scratch, but we've always acquired. So kind of, I have a different perspective from that angle. And it started in 2005 when we uh, purchased Caldi's with one cafe in St. Louis, and that really opened up our eyes in specialty coffee and we were the store that had the 40 different coffees and you know Ryan was talking earlier about the grinders and the you're dosing out your espresso and, and that was called eats and you know in 2005 when we came into the industry so I think at that point as the industry evolved we kind of had a choice we got into it a little differently because I think we got in the industry because of what coffee how it brought people together and from from there we got so passionate as we learned the industry from that perspective and um, as we got to know specialty coffee, for us it got to be, well gosh, there's a lot of opportunity to sell a lot better coffee out there. So, you know, how do we position ourselves within the industry to do that? So it started in St. Louis with Caldi's, but from there we, we met a guy at an SCA show and bought a company in Hawaii in 2008. And boy, at that time, let me tell you, we thought, oh, this is gonna be great. And then as you guys know, the economy tanked and as tourism drops, our business dropped. Um, but that opened our eyes to a whole new market of what specialty coffee could be, and so we bought a farm. And so, you know, we, we got into the farming side of the business, and then um, from there on, we, we uh, met a strategic partner in Japan and decided to expand in Japan, and that was also opening our eyes to coffee in a different way because at that time, specialty coffee in Japan was, I don't know, 10, 15 years behind where it was in, even in the U.S., so it gave us a different perspective on that. So. Um, you know, to us, this attention and what it's brought to the industry, I think is um, inspiring in so many ways. And so as we position ourselves to be in it for the long term, how do we continue to, to think bigger as an industry and look at this as a real opportunity to serve people great coffee? And those opportunities are out there. They, they're out there. So um, from there, we got into a strategic partnership in Nashville with the Froth Frothy Monkey team, and we opened a roaster, and we just launched a tea company this year, too. So I think there are very exciting times ahead for, for what this industry br um, brings, and I'm inspired. I'm inspired by, by the energy here and, and where things are going. So clearly, you see opportunity. 
opportunity. Growth opportunity. Mr. Zell. Yes. I mean, you and I have had many interesting conversations about this topic over the years. We have. I know uh, at La Marzocco, as Kent said earlier, we're, we're extremely committed to a company that continues on. Sure. Although I'm not sure we've always been able to understand exactly what that means. And as we reach kind of the, uh, the, the grayer periods of our career here, the, uh, what's gray hair anyway, um, where's that? There has to be some sort of end at the same time to the current period. So your recent, uh, the recent activities at Intelligentsia, what, what is that meaning to you personally and also for the company? Boy, um, let's see. Uh, to me personally, I, I get to ride my bike a little bit more, which is great. Um, and I think that um, for where we're going, uh, I think it just gives us more fuel to do um, what we set out to do. Um, and I think, you know, you asked about the industry, and I think that, uh, and where it's, this train's loud, isn't it? Uh, and, and about where it's going, and I, and I actually think I have to say, uh, you know, hats off to all of you, because what we set out to do 20 years ago, um, we're here, right? I mean, we, we, we actually changed the industry and what was possible, and credit to all of you, and, you know, whether it's smaller roasters or, or roast, well, us as a smaller roaster as well, but uh, what we thought coffee could be and what it is now and where it's going is, is wildly different. I think that we were chatting outside, and I remember somebody saying it, you know, when, when we first opened our doors in 1995, and it was some guys I went to college with, and I could hear them walking by as they, as they walked away, and they sort of snickered and said, God, what a dumb idea. I mean, the market's saturated here in Chicago. I mean, nothing's ever going to change in coffee. God, you know, this, this place will be closing in no time. Um, you know, I got an email from the same guy like 15 years later saying, boy, was I wrong. Um, and I think that, you know, what I can say now and in the, in the industry is we've, you know, well, you know, us and roasters like us and, and, and folks like you have transformed something, um, you know, from a, a commodity product to something that's culinary. And, and, and by doing that, there's really no end in sight now. I mean, to, to, to predict, predict what the future looks like, um, wow. I mean, who, who thought it would come to this and, and that we could, you know, and I, I guess I feel like I say this every five years, uh, and, and with all of you, I think we're just getting started. I mean, it, it, we're, it's going to go to an even more amazing place, you know, where we have an audience now that's listening, that's willing to t pay $5 for a, for a great espresso or, or, or $12 for a great espresso of an interesting single origin coffee or, or, or a brewed cup of coffee. I mean, it's where we want it to be. Um, and I think that, you know, if the last 20 years were amazing or the last 10, I mean, the next 20, 30, 40, um, my God, I mean, where could it go? And, 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 and you start to see, you know, great things happening in all these you know, smaller markets. Um, it, it's pretty impressive. And with millennials moving around, I mean, who, who knows where it can go? So um, for what we're doing, you know, and recent activities, uh, the only impact is, is, is more, uh, more wind in our sails. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I think as a company, we want to continue to, to innovate and lead and, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's get to have some fun now doing it. So um, I, I really feel like there's, there's no end in sight. Thanks, good answers. That leads really well into the next question. I'd like to ask each, actually each of you, um, if you could go back in time 10 years ago and what you were thinking, how, how close does your company resemble that vision now? Uh, Trisha, I'll start with you because you're about yeah. Your mark here. Well, last year at this time, I didn't even know we'd have a store opened in Atlanta today. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's one of those things that um, just like um, the speaker was saying earlier, you know, I think it's so important that you have a vision and you're able to articulate that vision and get the buy-in from the team and um, uh, create that direction of where you want to go. But you also have to remain flexible because things Things I've learned in the last 10 years will change really quickly. And if you have the right mindset about it, um, it can, it can in, um, impact you in ways you never thought possible. And I've seen people through the years, whether it's coffee or in other industries, you know, they'll be presented with that opportunity and they'll be like, oh, well, yes, but then I have to do this and that won't work because of this. And, you know, one thing that my dad has always taught us and I think instilled this in us to this day is what would have to happen if? What would have to happen if we did that? And then you start realizing, wow, that kind of changes the, you know, the way you think about something. So to me, 
you know, you, you've got to, as you look forward and you stay focused on that vision, you also have to remain flexible because there will be opportunities for us as an industry, um, you know, in, in ways we have to be able to react quickly and, and change. And I think that dynamic is going to be really important because the reality is the industry is changing so quickly. And the more flexible I think we're able to be, uh, the more successful we can be as a group. But we have to bring people along in that process, and we can't forget about that as we, as we move forward. Because one thing I think we tend to do sometimes is we talk to ourselves, and that's probably not unusual for, for most industries. But at the end of the day, if we're not bringing our customers along um, as we're changing, because we should be changing and innovating and progressing, then we're not doing them justice either. So that's something I know I've become very passionate about is let's make these changes, but then let's not forget about our customers and bring them along too, so. Thanks, great perspective. Brett, how about you? I was just reflecting on 10 years ago and I think I was having an argument with Peter Giuliano about opening retail. <laughs> um, oh God. And, uh, but I, and, and I was thinking about it, 10 years ago we opened our first training center in Charlotte, somewhere thereabouts, and we were, um, looking around trying to go from being a, a tiny little regional roaster to a tiny, you know, outside the, the, the region. It was hard for, to get to the next town over, so we were thinking about how do we grow, and we didn't want to do retail. So we did our first training center in Charlotte. And, um, and so I think we had this inkling, this idea that we could sort of take our show on the road without the roasters, um, take the cupping room and take that experience. And that was sort of the genesis or the, 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 the the genesis of our, our training center model, um, as we call it. We didn't call them training centers, which is a horrible name still. But, uh, um, but we were looking down the road trying to see where we could go. Um, I certainly, I don't know, in the back of our minds, maybe we hoped we could be a national company, but we, uh, we were really just trying to explore um, where we could take what we felt was a good model in Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, where when people come in and experience who we are, what we do, how we do things, and we can exchange ideas and, and, and push and pull each other, that's when we were first starting to see that as a company. So I, I don't know if I was looking out and seeing you know, the, the different training centers we have now and, and, and where that has allowed us to go, but I do, I do remember at that point um, we were trying to figure out the best way to continue growing. Would it be retail? Would it be wholesale? Would it be private label? Would it be a branded product? Would it be, what would it be? And uh, I think that's when we really started down the path of, of while we, were flex we have been flexible through the years, of really narrowing down our focus and finding sort of iterative process, finding what works and continue to improve upon that and make that better and better. So uh, 10 years seems like a long time, but it's also very quick. <laughs> so. It does tend to. Uh, I'm glad you remi reminded me of 10 years. Uh, let's see, 2006, um, I, I think at that point I was trying to convince people we should open up a, a coffee bar in Los Angeles. And, uh, and everybody said it was a really bad idea um, that nobody, you know, trying to convince, and there's probably some of you in the audience, that, that no one wanted to move there. Uh, they said it was a terrible place and that, you know, it, my God, why would we want to do it there? Um, so again, they, were, they, were, they weren't quite right. Um, so that, that was our, our, our move out of, you know, out, of, out of Chicago to another place. And I think it was uh, the first step in seeing that the market was much uh, broader and expansive than possible. And also I think the other thing that was very rewarding about moving there and, um, is that it, it is a place of sort of boundless creativity and uh, people are willing to try just about anything. And uh, it's where we you know, successfully made the, the, the play for the $5 cup of coffee. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that it worked. And uh, I mean, it, you know, it, it definitely taxed us in terms of, 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 of what was possible and resources and whatnot, um, but also gave us an expansive view about what might be possible um, you know, there and, and, and in other cities. And I think that, you know, speaking of what Brett's saying about, the, about, the, about, the, about being a national brand, I think that the view of what coffee bars can be is not the same as like, let's be a chain. I mean, I think that that perspective has changed and it's, it's, this, it's this idea of, of, of really building a meaningful company and a brand through how, you know, what sort of experience you can provide in, 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 in many places. Um, and uh, so for us, you know, 10 years ago, sort of opened that door for, you know, 
I guess, more or, or endless possibility. Um, and, 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 and uh, you know, and then we digested it and, and moved on. So it was, it, was, uh, it was pivotal, I guess. Look at that. So what's going to happen 10 years from now? What do you think things are going to look like? Uh, you, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew. Um, it's sort of what I touched on before. Of course, no one knows exactly. Um, but as I, what I touched on before, I think the market is just this migration towards quality, you know, up the quality pyramid, however you want to think about it. It's, it's it, to Doug's point, with this, this goal as an industry to try to help people understand and appreciate and, and appreciate the value that we see in these beautiful coffees and how they're presented. That is working. And what we see through our training centers and weekly cuppings where at this point, through all of our training centers together, we're getting, you know, 100, 150 people every week, just consumers mainly, that are coming in and we can just see it. They know more about coffee. They're more inquisitive. Um, the trends in food overall, I think those will continue. Um, and as I said before, there are literally billions of pounds that want to get better. Um, and what I mean by that is the consumer that's drinking those want, want that coffee to be better. Um, and, and that's pretty exciting. So I think in terms of specifics, I don't know, I just, but I do see this wonderful, it's an incredible product that people are, will continue to appreciate um, because there's more to learn about it. So from counterculture's perspective, I think, uh, you know, we're just gonna continue exploring how to make that link between um, this world of coffee, where it comes from, how it's done, all that which people seem to have this, this insatiable interest in, um, in making that connection with people um, so that, you know, it's just this sort of magical thing when you can make that connection with someone. And I don't think that's gonna change. I think, you know, countries of origin might change, processing, all, you know, roasting and, and preparation methods and um, all that's going to continue to evolve. But I think at the end of the day, uh, people are interested and products interested in what's being put in their mouth, you know, what they're, what they're drinking. Um, and I don't think that's going to change. And people want to continue learning and growing. Well, I would agree. You know, I, I, I know I can speak personally and probably for, for you three as well. I, we've all achieved some level of success now in our businesses and I don't take that for granted for an instant. Uh, and in spite of how good things are going, there's still those things that keep you up at night. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, for instance, in the equipment end of things, you know, we used to be able to keep pretty good tabs on what was going on. Competitors would typically show prototypes at a trade show or something mm -hmm. and have a pretty good feel for who was doing what. And now someone can go from an idea to a prototype in a garage in a nanosecond and things are coming up out of nowhere. Right. And that's puzzling to me, and, and it, uh, it, it's intriguing and it's challenging, but it n makes me nervous. So, Doug, for instance, what, what keeps you up at night nowadays? Uh, uh, less than what it used to, I guess. Um, no, I'm, I mean, I think that, I think that it, it comes down to the same thing. I mean, look, at La Marzocca has been around for a long time. Um, you know, I'd like to say Intelligentsia has been around for sort of, I, I don't know, 20 years isn't that long of a time. Um, but I think it, it's going to... Uh, you know, I, nothing is the answer. I mean, I think what, what, what keeps me up at night is, is worrying about how, how hard we're going to continue to work at it. And I think that, you know, as somebody I know in, in the wine business most eloquently put, he said that, you know, the dream is free, but the hustle is sold separately. And I think that that's eminently true. I mean, I think that, you know, and for a hobby, I race bicycles. You can't fake it. You got to put the time in. You got to put the effort in. And I think, sure, things will pop up just like small roasters and you know, and, and the people that, oh, please transition to the Q&A. The, the people, that, the people in, and businesses that will last are the ones that are going to keep working hard at it. You've got to keep showing up. So, I mean, I think the good news for all of you folks is that uh, you're, you're in the right place at the right time, which is great. Um, now you just have to keep working hard at it because there's always going to be threats to your business. And we talked about this. Um, you know, there were threats to your business. And, but you kept working at it. I mean, I think that's when, you know, that's when you dig in, but, but all of you probably know what your strengths and weaknesses are, or at least I hope you do. And uh, if you know what your weaknesses are, and you know what you have to work on on your game, 
that's what you got to work on. The other guy's going to keep opening in the garage, right? I mean, that's going to continue to happen. Someone's always going to be turning on a roaster. Someone's always going to be building another espresso machine. You know, somebody's always going to come up with another way of processing coffee. Um, but I think if you diligently work at your game, then the competition's you, you know? Then, then, then the pie really does become more expansive. You know, we talked, you know, we talked about collaboration and co collaborating with competitors and all of those things. But if you can make the competition yourself so, you know, you know where you, you got to be better, then, um, you know, the normal things will keep you up at night, like bankers and lawyers and all of those things that, you know, we can have longer discussions about that sometime. <laughs> and um, but, but, but then, yeah, then you, I don't want to say you shouldn't have anything to worry about, but if you can work on your game, then I think it'll be all right. Yeah, just I, I think I would like to add to that, you know, is as you see um, all of the success in the industry and the growth, you know, the one thing that I think will be interesting even in the next 10 years and what I think about it a lot is that some of the human capital behind all this and the yeah. leadership, right? Yep. Because as you grow a model, whether it's roasting, wholesale or retail or both, you know, we as an industry have to grow and develop yep. um, ourselves and each other at a leadership a level and and so finding and making sure we're developing um, ourselves within how the industry grows will be just as important to our success because yep. at the end of the day you know we can have the best coffee in the world but if we don't have the right people executing it and on the front lines um, it's it, it's just not going to work so I think you know as, as we continue to evolve 20 years is not that long no. we've got to make sure we're developing ourselves within that process Great. Brett Calm and cool. <laughs> um, sort of to Doug's point, I mean, it's um, what I think about a lot is continuing to build the company. And what I mean by that is trying to build the people, build the organization, build, build an environment and focus on the context of the company so that the team itself really challenges themselves, really think about it. I certainly have never had all the answers, but I've certainly been fortunate enough to work with people that push and pull and we challenge each other. And so I constantly am thinking about how to build the, the, the culture within counterculture um, so that we can keep challenging ourselves, so we can focus but yet be flexible, so that we can um, continue to look out and strive to accomplish our goals um, and not compromise and not um, not get caught up in the noise, but not ignore it. And so it's, it's that balance and, uh, and just trying to set that stage for people to come in and really, really push each other, challenge each other within the company. And I think if we can do that, then we can handle the, any of the, the big issues that come our way, I hope. Great, great perspective. Well, it's been, uh, it's been nice to get these lovely people to answer my questions. Now I think we have some time to open it up for a few questions, if there are any. Bear in mind, we can't see anything else. I know it cuts into cocktail hour, so I'll try and keep it quick. Yeah, I know this, I know this audience is going to have some questions. I'll come over here. All right. Uh, thank you all for being here. The uh, question I have is uh, just related to our industry and a kind of our sector. Um, especially coffee is becoming more and more available. I think that's because of the hard work of people in this room. Um, and uh, it's easier now than 10 years ago to walk into a cafe in any city and get a nice shot of espresso. So as our specialty industry becomes more accessible, as much as I hate to admit it, I think part of the reason why people love us so much is that we're a little exclusive or special. Or So as the taste experience becomes more accessible, what do you see or what are you doing within your companies to remain unique, uh, competitive, and innovative. I mean, I, I think it, as you say, that you know, this idea of the coffee is more accessible, right? You can get it in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You can get it in St. Louis. You can get it in, uh, I haven't been to Toledo, Ohio recently, but I'm sure there's a good coffee bar there. I was just in Greenville, South Carolina. You know, um, but I think that it's really, I, I think it's executing on the simple things, you know? I, I know that that sounds funny, but I can still walk into any of our shops or any of yours or, or you know, anybody's and uh, you know, there's still some light bulbs out. This, my staff will hear me complain about this or there'll still be gum on the floor um, or there could be more hustle in the service um, or it could be friendlier. I, I, think it's, I think it's just really, really good execution 
on the basic stuff is something that, you know, is, you know, if you want to call that innovation, I don't know. Um, but I do think that, you know, there's been a lot of talk about hospitality. Um, and, I, and I do think that very, that friendly, engaged service where we are, you know, engaging our customers but bringing them along and creating curiosity um, is huge. I mean, I think that's, you know, I have a 14-year-old daughter and, you know, she picked the school where, you know, for high school, like where, where they're going to meet, create curiosity about learning, you know, a, a, as a lifelong, you know, interest. And I think that in what we do each day, in the, in the simple execution of things, you know, clean bathrooms, right? Um, which, again, we're, we're guilty of, of, of many of these challenges, uh, you know, meeting many of these challenges ourselves. But I think, it, I think it's a basic execution. And then really, uh, the, the customer experience. I mean, continuing to build on that. I, I don't think if you ever, you know, if you have a great cup of coffee and the rest of the surroundings aren't great, it's only okay. But I mean, if you can make it a wonderful experience, um, they're gonna come back. So I, I just think it's simple. It's, 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 in, the, it's in getting the, the simple details <laughs> right. And Mike, you've probably heard me say this before, um, but you know, it's never really a lack of those ideas, but it's usually the lack of execution right. from what keeps you going from good to great, you know, but um, I think there's ways in the industry and that's what makes it fun and innovative, right? That we can continue to go where we are today and then figure out what's right for your own companies, whether it's you wanna expand your bakery line or do something cool with food that complements coffee. I mean, first and foremost, coffee should be the focus because we are a coffee company, but then there's also other ways I think you can expand and innovate and do things different to differentiate yourself in the market, um, you know, through strategic partnerships or um, having new products or whatever that is. But at the end of the day, there has to be a process in place to do it successfully. And Doug and I talked about this a little bit earlier. It's like, you know, there has to be discipline around that because at the end of the day, you can't forget about what the core business is. And, um, you know, you have to set aside that time that if you do want to introduce them, have ways that you can move them in and move them out if they don't work. So setting aside that time and putting the discipline around it. From our perspective, I'll, I'll sound like a, bit, a little, little bit of a broken record. I think that, um, yes, you have to execute. Um, yes, you have to have wonderful quality coffee. And there is an amazing access to coffee for roasters of all sizes. And the consumer's getting more and more uh, knowledgeable. But to that, that, that thing that we've discovered in, in our training centers, and uh, we don't have retail shops, so it's uh, either we're dealing with a wholesale customer or we're dealing with the in consumer that comes in. The consumer people, everyone in this room is here to learn. Everyone's at the show to here to learn. And sure, there's a financial aspect to, you know, while we're here as a business, but we're, we want to continue evolving. And we want to continue advancing ourselves. And it might, uh, sometimes when I say this, I, I feel like it sounds hokey, but the reality is, is when you bring these products um, to a, a, a customer, a consumer, um, and, and you can share something and you can sort of make a connection where you can grow together. Um, if you execute it right, it's gotta be a beautiful presentation, a beautiful cup, beautiful, everything has to be great, but ultimately, if you're just handing them a product and walking away, they might enjoy it, but there's not a real connection there. So we always talk about trying to make that connection and, and growing together, and to me, that's where I think a lot of our success has been of, of building relationships that you can keep growing um, in the meantime, busting your ass to get the best coffee, executing on the highest level, but taking it a step further where there's an interaction, a personal interaction between you and whoever's right in front of you. Uh, with the realities of climate change, uh, emerging markets, uh, and in general, greater competition for specialty coffee, we do say, you know, that billion those billion pounds want to be better, but it's could be 10 billion that need to get better. Yeah. How do you guys prepare for the reality, or how are you preparing for the fact of specialty becoming more finite, more scarce uh, on the on the supplier side? World Coffee Research. Um, <laughs> So the, I don't know if you're familiar, there's an organization called World Coffee Research. I happen to be on the board and chair of the board. Um, and th these are real issues that if you, if you take just a few minutes and look at all the, 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 the dynamics that are going on with supply and demand, 
it can scare the hell out of you. And they're real with climate change and, and the effect on, on supply. And, and we do have to face that fact. And, and so I think organizations like World Coffee Research, first acknowledging that these issues are real. I think everybody in this room, we're certainly preaching to the choir, but um, these are real issues that are gonna affect this incredible industry. So it's gonna take um, what we call pre-competitive collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, and around that table, um, uh, I guess the, technically the number of, of, of uh, businesses is shrinking, but the people are still there. So it's uh, <laughs> Green Mountain, Intelligentsia, Pete. Smartass. Um, uh, Smartass, uh, Counterculture. <laughs> um, uh, but but it's, it's, it's a group of, of, in relative terms, small roasters all the way up to some of the largest roasters and now the second largest roaster or coffee company in, in the world. And everyone around that table is viewing this as a real issue yep. and trying uh, to re apply really high level science, genetic research, um, taking from other industries that have faced similar, uh, similar challenges, um, keeping the idea at the top that it has to be quality, it has to be sustainable, it has to be good for the whole supply chain to the best of our ability while we do face the realities of it. So I think it's, it's something that we need to continue addressing and you know, World Coffee Research, look at the website if you can participate. It's going to help, and we're doing great, great work. I know something that I think about, too, as from the equipment perspective is, uh, and something I don't hear talk about very much, is, is waste and reducing yep. waste yeah. in the coffee bar. I mean, it's going to get to the point where each and every bean is incredibly valuable. So where I know we're working and trying to incorporate, incorporate technology that, for instance, makes it easier for a barista and quicker and less wasteful to dial in uh, what Alfredo's working on with the, with the weighing device on the grinders. Uh, we really want to try to limit waste going forward. Hi. Uh, at what point in, um, uh, in your coffee roasters um, kind of start to now, do you feel you guys reached a tipping point um, as far as like kind of getting, uh, growing your business in a way that it just sort of started to snowball? Because um, you, you guys all run some of the most successful roasters in the industry. So at what point do you feel you guys got there? Uh, uh, still getting there. Uh, I, no, I, I think that, uh, you know, you hit an interesting crossroads at one's business where you can decide that um, you're creating something that is only meaningful to what maybe you and your, you know, the, the partners of the business. Um, or you know, as we speak, uh, as we spoke of this idea of creating a stage to, to have more people be successful. Um, I've always said for a while there, I didn't, uh, that, that, you know, I was, one, one of the things I really enjoyed most was that I wasn't the only person that owned a house that worked in intelligentsia. Um, and I think that, you know, you cross those bridges to create opportunity for others. And, and I think other folks decide just to stay small or smaller. Um, and I don't know if it's a, uh, I don't know, a, a willful chasm that you leap across to uh, say, hey, we're now, now we're, you know, now we're at this point. Uh, to some extent, I think it just happens, and and, and, you, and you get to those, um, you know, you get to those points. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and it depends on what success looks like to you. I mean, it's, it's very, very different for, for different people. Um, and then as you, you know, as you grow, you say, gosh, we could do some more of this, or you know, hey, are we buying enough coffee from these kind of producers, and, and what are we doing, and and how many other folks can we bring on board to sort of, you know, grow this. Um, so, I, you know, I, my answer is I actually can't point to a specific time when I felt like there was a tipping point, but it's always, you know, you, you go a little further than you, you want to go a little further. Um, at least that, that's how it was for me, so. I think to piggyback off of that too, you know, I think uh, as you make decisions in your business, you know, it's always rooted in the long-term time horizon. So whenever you're faced with you know, when you're gonna open a shop or you're gonna decide to roast or whatever it is, you know, setting yourself up for success for the long run. And so if it's something that's short term or will only benefit you in the short term, those are things we just say no, you know? And um, I think it's always changing, but I always try to keep those decisions rooted in the, the long-term time horizon. Yeah, my, mine's kind of silly. Um, we used to have folders for every single customer at Counterculture in this big <laughs> file cabinet. And I used to, and I basically sold every single one of those customers. 
And the day I looked in there and there was a file, and it sounds weird, but I didn't know that customer. I was like, we made it. Which, <laughs> which to me, that was, we're, we were building an organization and building a team. And then, and then there are other couple of, and of, of similar situations where, to me, I've always just tried to bring in people. And um, when there were people making decisions that I had no clue about in terms of, I couldn't have made that decision. I didn't know enough about it. And it was a wonderful decision. That was a great moment. And I knew we were building a team. Um, that was sort of more internal. And then external, I mean, I think uh, we were fortunate enough uh, with Intelligency and Stubtown, there was just, you know, the, the wave that came across, the third wave, as they say. Um, and we just benefited from a lot of that momentum, and it was, it was kind of amazing to us, um, the, the recognition we were getting. And, uh, and, and it, it, was, it, was a, it still is a wonderful time, but that was all of a sudden we were, we were in newspapers and people were asking about us and in books and it was a strange time but it was a, an interesting time when I realized this is bigger than just a little business school project that I had and, um, you know in a 700 square foot little space. Yeah I mean I think that you know I, I would, I'm not can't speak for everyone but I'm still sort of surprised to be here so. Yeah. Um. The scary part though for me is when they figure out they don't need you to help them with those decisions. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And what still happens that happened a long time ago. Yeah. You yeah, have a exactly. retail store in the first month you turn profitability, that's exciting. But then the next month you're not profitable and you're yeah. like, dang, yeah. I thought we were got the tipping point. So <laughs> Okay, I think we'll take one more question. You uh, you mentioned um, human capital. Uh, can you share any retention tools that you've um, found successful as you've grown your, your company and worked on company culture? Oof. Ah, uh, boy. Uh, I mean, I, I think build a great company. I mean, I, you know, I think that that's, it's a challenge, but, I, but I, you know, I certainly, and some of them are here in the room, I, I think folks, folks will leave, and I think that's all right. Um, I think that we've always, you know, as an entrepreneur, I've always uh, uh, believed in people going their own way when they want to um, and doing something great. Um, I think when you get great people while they're passing through, that's still a tremendous thing. And folks in this room have contributed amazing things to intelligentsia and really helped to build us to become what we are. Uh, I think treat them well um, for as long as you can um, and try, I mean, this is why there is the reason to continue to innovate and grow so that you can provide opportunity for, for the best people. Um, will they always stay? They won't. Um, but I think if you build a great company um, with integrity, you know, and we, we, we all occasionally lose our way. Um, you build a, a great company with integrity, the likelihood of them staying is, is much, much better. And I think that you should pay them as much as you can and provide the best benefits that you can, um, which means you need to charge your customers enough, um, and all of those things, uh, and, and allow them to contribute. Like, great ideas come from everywhere, and I think, and really setting the stage for people to be successful and allow them to contribute will get them to stay. So, nothing mysterious. I wish there was some great plan that I could tell you that would keep everybody there as long as you wanted, um, but if somebody else knows about that, let me know. I, I'm, I'm game, so. The one thing I would say is just that you, I think you get to a point, it's like, how do you define your culture, right? And I, I would say, I think I was overthinking it for a long time. Like, oh, it's a great culture and we're flexible or we have these things and people get to take home free coffee. But at the end of the day, it was really just our core values. Like to me, that's what described our, our culture. And, you know, so it, it's something that I think most companies, some put on a wall, some don't, they talk about it. At the end of the day, you, you truly have to believe in those values and you have to bring along the right people that fit within those values because you can't hire someone and force them into values they don't have, right? So that really begins in the recruitment process to say, hey, are they a culture fit? Do they fit within these values? And the more tightly you can define it and keep it going, when you bring someone in that's not a fit within that culture, they stand out really quickly and that's okay. It doesn't have to be home for everyone, but it's really defining what that culture looks like. I mean, for, for me, um, I started counterculture right out of business school and I, have, I was fortunate enough to get a lot of education and I, and I came out with this total education bias, thinking people have to have, they have to have the degree, they have to have, you know, whatever. And, but when we started counterculture, we had zero money. And, and so we, we were just hiring whoever we could. And in, in my mind, I was like, we, we're gonna, one day we're going to have to get you know, MBAs and all this stuff uh -huh. to join us. And you know, the, the realization very quickly was um, employee number one at Counterculture is still there. Um, 
I think he barely made out of high school, I think. I don't even know. But it, he, he's been just this, it, it was a lesson to me about um, creating an environment where people can find self-fulfillment and self-actualization and all this stuff. And that sounds kind of hokey, but it's not. We all want to succeed. We all want to, to, to uh, be challenged. And so I think one thing that's worked, some by design, some by luck, at Countercultures, we created an environment where people are challenged and can go out and, and take risks and take ownership themselves. And that's what I've tried to foster. And I think that when you create that, there's, there's a different level of ownership people have with the company. And, and, and it becomes less, although they're absolutely, you know, the financial aspect of it, the compensation, the benefits, all that's critical. And you have to check those boxes, so to speak. But ultimately, I th I, what I found, the people that uh, stick around the longest just what you're saying are the ones, there's a, a certain culture, they fit into it, they feel like they're part of something mm -hmm. and they're accomplishing something and they feel like they, ha they have the opportunity to continue doing that, taking on more challenges and growing within the organization. Um, so you do have to pay well and you do have to take care of those, but ultimately I think uh, creating that place where people can feel like they really are contributing to their own growth, um, that, that keeps people around for a long time. Thank you all. Um, Thank you. Yes, we are, we're so happy to have all three of you. Um, and yes, to contribute your, your knowledge and your expertise and all of, the, uh, all of your experience over the years. Um, so thank you. Um, Thanks for the three of you. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. <laughs>